Some years ago, an experiment was conducted with chickens. They were kept in a cage for half a year and then one day laid out on the beautiful green grass where the sun was shining and the birds were singing. What do you think happened? Well, surely they decided to leave the chicken cage, right? Only to return after 30 seconds. I call this the chicken cage syndrome, the fear of change, or rather, the fear of the unknown. So how do you get the chickens out of the cage and how do you make them stay out for good? You'll find out right now. Hey everyone, welcome to all our viewers across the world, our World Business Forum audience and all our Chief Executive Magazine readers. I'm Martin Lindstrom, your co-host, along with my dear friend and the world's number one leadership coach, Marshall Goldsmith. Now, Marshall is a member of the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame and has written some of the most iconic books out there, like What Got You Here Will Get You There and Mojo, How To Get It. But beside all those fancy credentials. I think more importantly, Marshall is just super unique. He's unique because he has an ability to connect with people and really make them feel special while also telling them a message which is important. I mean, I so much have to learn from Marshall on that one. So listen, Marshall, once again, I'm so glad that you're still hanging into this show. Well, let me say, I am so honored to be here with my wonderful friend, Martin. Martin is so many accolades, one of the 100 most influential people in the world in Time Magazine. He is author of some spectacular books, including things like biology and the Ministry of Common Sense. And you know what else? A good guy. Also, though, I think Martin is the most interesting human being I've ever met. He's had a fascinating life. You just read about the guy. I love his life. I love what he's doing. World's expert on branding, number one, Martin. Thank you, Marshall. I mean, um, I would have to blush ongoing here with all this stuff you've been saying, but I have to tell you one thing. I think with the two guests we have on this show, once again, I'm going to let you down, right? Anyway, if you like this show, don't forget to press the like button or the follow button or the subscribe button. Now, I have to tell you one little thing. Today's show is all about chickens, or rather, uh, we'll use a lot of metaphors using chickens. Now, one of our guests will reveal why. So how do you get those chickens out of that cage I mentioned for you? Well, let's visit those chickens stocked in that cage for a second. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring on a little bit of an illustration on my screen right now. I'm just doing a drawing of four chicken cages seen from the top, all surrounding a little square. Now, this is what I've learned over the years working with companies around the world. I'm going to be a very nice to those chickens. I'll open the cage so they can go out in the beautiful green grass. Now, here's my question for all of you guys watching. Where would you place the corn in case you want to have these chickens leaving the cage? On your keyboard right now, share with me where would you place the corn? Because this is an extraordinary important question. The issue is that most people, I think Tom from Hickory right now is suggesting in the middle. Let's just try that for some. So Tom, this is in the middle. What is going to happen then? Well, if you take a look at chicken A, chicken B and chicken C and D, well, what are they going to do? First of all, they'll look at that corn in the middle and gosh, that's far away. My KPIs are not supporting it. And even worse, what if my manager, the crazy manager I have coming up with all those ideas is being fired? I'll look like an idiot. So what is Chicken A going to do, Tom? Well, he's going to look, or she is going to look at B, Chicken B, and basically just say, listen, what is Chicken B doing? Chicken B will look at Chicken C and Chicken C and Chicken D, and everyone will look at everyone. And what will they conclude? Let me go straight back into the cage again. This is really what I call the chicken cage syndrome. Because here's the issue. One thing I've learned is to break this down into what we call 90-day interventions, short-term conclusions. So instead of pressing that little corn down in the middle, place it just outside the chicken cage. 
short enough distance for the chickens to grab it, feel an instant gratification, celebrate a success within the company. So everyone else can see, wow, if I change, in fact, the whole company will change. And then you can place another piece of corn getting closer and closer to the center of where you really want to go. Now, that's the 90-day interventions. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about over these many minutes from now. Because having tried this approach hundreds of times, I can tell you one thing, it works. But why does it work? On today's show, we have two guests, uh, which will tell you much more about what chicken teaches us about psychology, safety, psychological safety, teamwork, and talent. Marcel, tell us more about our first guest. Our first guest is Margaret Heffernan, a wonderful person with a refreshing personality. In a sea of boring academics, she is certainly not boring. She has been the CEO of five companies. She's an author of six big, big books, and she worked for 13 years with the BBC. She's been ranked as a top 100 media executive. I love her concept of willful blindness, which I just see so much in the real world. It's so refreshing to hear her talk about it. She's also had 8 million TED views, among other things. And one of her most famous TED shows is about super chicken. So, Martin, we are so lucky to have Margaret with us today. We are welcome, Margaret. Listen, I'm just thinking about Margaret before we sort of introduce you to the world of chickens. Why don't we just play a video where you talk about chickens? It's much easier, right? Huh. Evolutionary biologist at Purdue University named William Muir studied chickens. He was interested in productivity. I think it's something that concerns all of us. But it's easy to measure in chickens because you just count the eggs. He wanted to know what could make his chickens more productive, so he devised a beautiful experiment. Chickens live in groups, so first of all, he selected just an average flock, and he let it alone for six generations. But then he created a second group of the individually most productive chickens. You could call them super chickens. And he put them together in a super flock, and each generation he selected only the most productive for breeding. After six generations had passed, what did he find? Well, the first group, the average group, was doing just fine. They were all plump and fully feathered, and egg production had increased dramatically. What about the second group? Well, all but three were dead. They'd pecked the rest to death. I love, I love that. So, Margaret, what is the solution to the super chicken dilemma? Well, the solution to the super chicken dilemma lies in what happened to the average flock, which is the average flock did very, very well. And I think, you know, the moral of the story is that a lot of so-called management thinkers with a very, very loose understanding of Darwin used to think, well, if you create conditions in which everybody has to compete fiercely, then the best will rise to the top and you'll get this phenomenal productivity. And of course, what we've discovered over time is exactly what the super chicken experiment shows you, which is actually what happens is they just all kill each other. And we see this in corporate politics all the time. You see it in teams undermining other teams when they're both doing pitches. I mean, I think, you know, every time I tell that story, I get this kind of horrible laughter of recognition from the audience because they all know who the super chickens in their organizations are. Now, Margaret, I just want to build on one topic because, of course, the super chicken concept also comes back to creating powerful cultures, right? And I... I know you, just like me, have a really ambivalent relationship to technology, which I think a lot of people claim it is here to, to change and improve culture. I have a nagging feeling of that you kind of of the opposite opinion about this topic. Share with me what the role of technology is, how it is, I think, destroying culture, and how you navigate this right now. So I'll just tell you one story about a company I worked with, which, you know, we'd done a lot of strategy work. We'd kind of worked on the product offering. We looked at the market. We looked at, you know, the sales process, all of that sort of stuff. And there was only one thing left to talk about, which was people. 
And the CEO said to me, well, you know, we've got our, our um, engagement data and, um, and it shows that it's going up. And I said, well, from what to what? He said, well, from 59 to 62%. And so what does that mean? It just, it may just mean all the people who hated working here have left. And the point is that because he was relying on technology to poll his people and do the survey and monitor the people and see, you know, who was staying late and who was working hard. He was completely depending on technology for his communication and his sense of how the organization was functioning. The consequence of that was he didn't know anything about what was going on in his organization. He didn't know why the numbers had moved. He didn't know if it meant anything. And when I, and after we kind of made that clear, he said, well, then how would I know? And I left this pregnant pause for as long as I could thinking, oh, come on, this is so obvious. And finally I broke the news to him that the way he would find out would be if he actually talked to people. And there was this kind of stunned silence (laughs) And I think, you know, as we're all so busy emailing and texting and, you know, doing all this stuff and Zooming and blah, 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 you know, we have kind of forgotten that in the face-to-face moment of talking to somebody and getting to know them over time and building trust and developing generosity and reciprocity and starting to know people as people, not just, you know, places on the org chart or just titles. If you really know people, then you start really to understand and to get great rich communication about them, about the environment, about the culture, complex information of a kind that technology dumbs down so that it has a kind of simple authority, which is totally misleading. And it's very well understood in technology. And bear in mind, I used to work in technology Right, that when we use devices, we're essentially outsourcing to a machine what we used to do ourselves. Now, if I think of my smartphone, I don't know my kids' phone numbers, but I'm okay. I'm very fine with outsourcing all those numbers I used to have to keep in my head. I'm not comfortable outsourcing my capacity to have a human conversation with somebody. I'm not comfortable learning to shout at Alexa and forgetting how to talk confidentially to a human being. So there is always a trade-off in the way that we use tech, and we have to think about at what point is it a good trade-off, happy not to have a head full of phone numbers? At what point is it a bad trade-off, very unhappy if I can't have a meaningful conversation with someone whom I know well because I've been talking this way for a long time? You know, a, a couple of reflections. I, I I remember I did a session when I had feedback on all these people in this company, and it was a huge company and allegedly supposed to be successful. Uh, 11 of these people ended up being CEOs. They were like mega gods. While they all worked together, <laughs> they were awful. <laughs> Teamwork was zero. The company was losing money. It was a pretty famous example. It was so hilarious because they all ended up being really pretty good CEOs on their own, but they just couldn't get together at all. They reminded me a bunch of super chickens. I never thought about that concept, but it seemed so real. You know, another thing, another thing, I love your concept of willful blindness. I think it has been important yeah. in the past, but it's been much more important in the future. Can you just talk about why it matters so much? Yeah, so willful blindness is a legal term. Uh, the law says that if there's in, that there's knowledge that you could have had and should have had and somehow managed not to have, then you're deemed to be willfully blind because you had an opportunity for knowledge that you shirked and you're responsible for the consequences. And I first hmm. encountered this when I was writing two plays for the BBC about the collapse of Enron and I read the transcript of the trial of the chairman and chief executive. And the right. judge in his summing up cited this idea. And it just, it was like a kind of magnet dropped into all the iron filings in my brain. You know, everything I'd ever read, thought, and seen kind of cohered around this idea. I thought about organizations, you know, that that were staring the future in the face and couldn't see it. You know, on the day that Netscape went public. Microsoft didn't have a browser in development. You know, when Facebook was growing by leaps and bounds, 
Google wasn't had no social networking offer at all. All these companies packed full of super smart people who could see things somehow didn't see things. And I thought about other things, you know, obviously the the financial crisis, the crisis in the Catholic Church. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, you know, one reason I keep issuing new editions of the book is because the examples just are there over and over and over again. And I think it poses a very profound leadership question, which is, how is it in organizations that people who are smart and do have knowledge and do have goodwill somehow manage not to see what's obvious? And some of it is about obedience and conformity. Some of it is because they're simply too busy to think. That's quite common. Um, right. Very long hours and fatigue are hugely implicated, but also a mm. big part of it is what organi- you know, researchers call organizational silence. I do know there's a problem or a gigantic opportunity, but I'm afraid to speak up. And everybody feels the same way. And since nobody starts, the conversation that most needs to be had is never had. Now, as we move on, I am so pleased to tell you a little bit more about humor and laughter because our next guest is Sophie Scott, a professor in neuroscience. She's, she's also researching the voice, speech, and laughter. She's published more than 200 papers on the behavioral psychology. And she's also, guess what, a stand-up comedian. I don't know how that works out, but we're going to find out. Welcome, Sophie. Hi. Hello. <laughs> so listen, so good to have you here. I mean, you studied laughter. Tell me a bit about the psychology of laughter and why it is so powerful in a corporate context. The psychology of laughter is its very interesting because it's all very counterintuitive. So we tend to think that laughter is about jokes and comedy and humor, and that's what makes us laugh. But actually, I mean, we do laugh at those things, but most of the laughter you produce is happening just because you're with other people. You're 30, three zero times more likely to laugh if there's someone else with you than if you're on your own. And you'll laugh more if you know those people and you'll laugh more if you like those people. So it's we think it's a, something to do with humor and it is associated with humor, but it has this much bigger life, which is the, a social behavior. It's a social emotion. It's an emotion that lives in, in interactions with other people. Hmm. I'm not sure I understand. You know, you know, Toby, when we talked last, when we talked last, you said something I thought was very profound. You talked about groups using dark humor as a way to help them cope. Uh, for mm. example, hospitals, police people. I mean, I, that, I've never heard that concept before, but I thought it was fascinating. Can you, if you don't mind, can share that with a group? Absolutely. So a very common use of laughter is, um, is to sort of show that things are okay. I'm fine. This is a sort of be, a, be more playful in your intention. And you see that absolutely everywhere, but it's incredibly important in stressful situations, particularly when people have to work with very difficult topics or difficult things to deal with, and they have to work in a team. Particular kind of forms of dark humor start to come about that are very specific to that job. And those seem to be both very efficient ways of dealing with the stress because you get to acknowledge and laugh at the thing that's stressing you. You get to feel better because you've been laughing. You get to improve your connections with the people that you're working with. You work better as a team because you've been laughing together. And actually, it also excludes everybody who's not in on the joke. So actually, on many mm. different levels, it's you can think of laughter as being something that is providing lots of different kinds of benefits to people in working interactions as well as in the rest of their lives. So it's a, it's a it's a fine balance, isn't it? I'm thinking about we are in this uh, political correctness age now, where you hardly dare to say anything right now. And um, how do you navigate it? In fact, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to <laughs> take you by surprise here and play a video clip from your prime minister in the UK and just have your reflections on this particular piece of humor, right? Kermit the Frog sang. It's not easy being green. You remember that one? I want you to know that he was wrong. (laughs) (laughs) 
Why? Why? Why would you do that to me? <laughs> it's ah. Uh, it's very interesting as a piece of comedy because it doesn't work. People aren't laughing. And the one of the extraordinary things about live comedy is it's an art form where you know in the moment if it's working or not, because if there's no laughter, it's not working. And he says, oh, it's not easy. But Kermit the Frog, do you remember him? Because I didn't get the laugh I thought I'd get when I said I mentioned Kermit the Frog. And it's 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 just dreadful to watch because he starts to get a little bit of like a, a uh, sounds from the audience you clearly are sort of well you know if we don't give him something he's going to keep asking us um but it, it's painful it's painful to watch i think it's got less to do with political correctness and more to do with a somewhat too great a sense of confidence that anything hey anything i do is hilarious people will love this i'm going to talk about kermit the frog he was green it's... that's funny You know, so, um, I just want to. I, I, I have one question for Sophie. So, yeah, I've got the ultimate respect for anybody as a stand up comedian. That takes guts because you got to die up there sometime. And, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you do it? How do you stand up there when you're just dying? Because I'm sure if you've done enough comedy, you have to have died sometime up there on the stage. You, you do. And it's, I mean, it, one of the first things that you have to learn when you do stand up comedy. And you can actually only learn it when there's an audience there is that when you get to a point when you're expecting the audience to laugh, you have to stop. You have to stop talking. You may even you know, take a drink or do something just kind of cues. This is the punchline. And also, yeah. if they don't laugh at that point, to then carry on without look, without looking like you're mortified. And you can only learn to do that with an audience. And if you want a really classic mistake that new comedians make or people are doing it for the first time or first few times if they keep talking through their punchline, they, they get to a funny bit and then they don't leave that gap. And the audience will start laughing and then they'll stop because they want to hear what you're saying. So it's a, it's more like a weird conversation, stand-up comedy, than it is a sort of a, a, a comedic monologue. But that means that, of course, there is the tremendous possibility that they won't laugh. If they don't laugh when you're expecting them to, you have to get through that. And then, of course, that builds up. They are not laughing. You realise that you are dying. And it's awful. It's absolutely awful. So I find that the the main that it's it's good in two ways. First of all, you learn from this. Like, what did you do wrong? Because it will be something about people blame the room or they'll blame people who are ordering drinks. But it's also stuff that you've done. You know, you you put something. Oh, one of the worst times I've died is when I did a whole routine about the the science of disgust, and it turns out I was just much too disgusting. I think I just upset people. But so it, you can kind of deal you deal with it in the moment, and and it's, there's a, there's almost a kind of almost bizarre kind of triumph in not letting it show that it's got to you. You know, like I will get to the end of this and I will, as if you were laughing, I will give you the same thing. And then, of course, you go home and you feel horrible. Um, and the comedian Sarah Millican in the UK has this rule called the 11 o'clock rule, which is you can feel sorry about yourself until 11 o'clock the next day and then forget about it. Because if you go into your next gig thinking about how you just died, you'll do it again. And it's, so it is actually quite useful as a sort of discipline to make yourself get rid of the stuff that was an unpleasant memory, learn from it what you can, and then stop complaining about it, move on from it. There's always bad audiences. Ma it was them, not you. Margaret, I want to bring you into the picture here because you, know, you talk a lot about tribes. You talk about creating the right constellation of people. You also say that we lost the human side or increasingly because of technology losing this human side. When you listen to what Sophie is talking about with laughter, what do you take with you home here? What ingredients would you use in your leadership style if you were a leader watching this right now? Well, I, I mean, I, I really love Sophie's work partly because she really puts her finger on something, which is that um, when things are are intrinsically very funny, people tend to get quite serious. And when they're really catastrophic, they tend to laugh. And the laughter is a fantastic release of tension. And it does build quite a lot of sense of, of solidarity if it's, you know, the right joke in the right moment. And certainly when I was, you know, directing uh, drama for the BBC, if I was directing a really deeply depressing play, we'd laugh all day. And if we were, if, we were, if I was directing a comedy, nobody'd laugh at all, not at all. Um, 
so it's, you know, it's very counterintuitive. I think it's super hard as a leader to know how to use uh, comedy well. I mean, clearly Boris Johnson doesn't, as we saw from that clip. Um, and it's risky because you do risk alienating people who don't get it or might not know the reference or whatever. So, you know, one of the funny things doing this for me about doing the super chicken talk was, you know, when I, the first time I ever gave it, I was kind of amazed that people laughed because, you know, when I was rehearsing on my own, nobody laughed. You know? And so it's, it's quite a tricky thing, quick, a tricky thing to use, but in really great teams, what you'll see is that they develop a kind of a, a kind of comedy language, which is a sort of gentle teasing or reference to things in the past. And I even know mm. companies I've worked with that now, if they discover they have super chickens, so hyper competitive people who want to dominate, um, instead of trying to pull them down or shut them up, they just quietly start clucking in the background and it does the trick. Everybody knows what the statement is, right? It's not too mean, but you know, the temperature goes down a bit and people get back to doing kind of listening to each other. Absolutely love it. Listen, we have a viewer out here which is asking a hilarious question. I'm going to just read it loud. My question is, behind every successful man, there is always a woman. My question is, who is behind an unsuccessful man? This is Sabash from Tamil Nadu in India. I would say that behind an unsuccessful man is usually a really brutal competitive father mm. who's saying you're not good enough you're not good enough try harder you're useless that would be my guess i mean when i think of the less effective leaders i've known in my career um that's usually what they've grown up with mm. margaret that is a killer answer i have to say but it also leads me into the next part I want to cover here, we have a question from, we call it the BCG Minute. In fact, a recent study, uh, how to future-proof your workforce based on 366,000 respondents across 197 countries, because basically it's the whole world. Now, in this BCG study, they revealed that, among others, fear plays a major role in corporations. In fact, fear alone reduces the productivity with some 30%. Now, I want to play this video uh, for you guys, and I think I'll start with you, Margaret, just to hear your reflections. Let's roll the tape. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rich Sheridan. I'm the co-founder, CEO, and chief storyteller here at Menlo Innovations in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I have a question for the M&M panel. When did fear become the big thing in management thinking? When did we ever begin to believe that leading people with fear was the right way to manage human beings? I think it's one of the biggest challenges we have in workplaces today We've got to root it out. We've got to teach our leaders how to get this fear out of the room, to pump fear out of the room. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. So, you know, some of this starts in the 1960s with a social psychologist named Doug McGregor, who had this, what he called theory X and theory Y. They weren't very scientific theories, you know, and one said people come into work in order to not work and to undermine and to be lazy and to skive off. And they've got to be managed and pushed and beaten into submission, basically. And so you have to manage them with sticks. Well, and then the other theory is, you know, the carrot theory, essentially. No, no, no. Give them things to look forward to and rewards and all this sort of thing. So it's a very kind of uh, vicious, simplistic way of conditioning people. Fast forward, a, you know, a couple of decades and you get GE proselytizing this notion of forced ranking, right? Measure everybody mm. once or twice a year. Really reward the top 10% and give them all sorts of cool titles and projects and send them on swanky executive training programs. And then the bottom five or 10% just throw them out because they're obviously rubbish. 
Now, what's so fascinating to me about forced ranking is, A, you don't have to be a mathematical whiz kid to see the safest place to be is in the big fat middle of the bell curve. Just be average. Not too good because then you have lots of super chickens that you have to fight with. And not so bad, you get thrown out. So actually, it's the recipe for mediocrity. And when I asked people in GE a couple of years ago why they'd thrown out their forced ranking system, they said, well, it's real utility is it made it really easy legally to fire people. But when we crunched the data, we saw that nobody ever moved in their ranking, really. You know, if they say if they found a safe spot, they just hung on to it. And you saw something similar at Microsoft, which for years, you know, missed databases, mobile games, all sorts of major technologies. And it was, you know, and when they finally gave up their forced ranking, you know, the creativity of the company just absolutely exploded. It was tremendous. But so these managerial systems create a sense of fear, which either means people give up, learn helplessness, or they start, you know, trying to make other people fail so that they look good. So it's a kind of terrible mindset with which to try to inspire people and give them the sense of freedom and autonomy they need to come up with their very best thinking. One other point, you know, I've written in Will for Blindness a lot about organizational silence. This is research done by two academics, Morrison and Millikan at New York University Stern School of Business, where they asked a whole cross section of executives, do you have issues or concerns at work that you don't voice? 85% of them said yes. The reason? Fear of retribution from my colleagues or my supervisor. That's a lot of silence. That's a lot of ideas, creativity, concern that's not being articulated because people are still afraid at work. Marshall, you as a coach, you would have seen this. Why is it that these leaders are doing that? Well, I mean, to me, this idea of you know, wind well, and let's try the cave. Let's try, the cave. Just, just try the cave. That's where it started. I mean, we've we've been managing by humans have been managing by fear for centuries. So I think what's healthy in the future is trying not to have fear be the, the major motivator and do something different for a change. I mean, let, let's face reality. All these people talking about the new world and how bad it is. Hello, did you ever read a history book? What do you think that was like? It was worse. It was worse. I mean, so I, I think fear has been with us for a long time. I think that, uh, you know, what Margaret is saying is fantastic because Peter Drucker said, look, the leader of the past knows how to tell. The leader of the future knows how to ask. All that crap that may or may not have worked in the past is not going to work in the future. So, Fee, and I mean, you started New Science, and I assume that the fear spot must be the amygdala or something like that. Tell me a little bit more about the New Science aspect of this and how you navigate this transition we have from a fear-based leadership culture to a, a very collaborative culture. Well, I was just thinking when you were talking about this, how similar it is in science in terms of our understanding of human behavior. There's a tremendous amount of research into fear. If I go on to the main database for scientific papers and put in the term emotion, expression, fear, I'll get back thousands of papers, well over 4,000 papers. If I switch out fear for laughter, I'll get back about 150 papers. And it's it really is the case that we have constructed generally when we talk about emotions in, in, sort of, in the sciences what we mean are negative emotions only relatively recently people like Barbara Friedrichsen have been arguing we should study the positive stuff as well because that matters but it seems less scientific so you can take you know one of the reasons why fear is so big in neurosciences is you can study it in mice we can operationalize what fear means in mice and then we can apply that to, to humans and to our understanding of the brain in what looks like a seamless way and that's great but mice also play. They do happy things. We just choose to, to ignore that in terms of building our, our models of emotion. So I think there's enough. There is a change coming and it's happening. There is more work now when people have sort of taken a step back and said important as negative emotions are. Positive emotions are, if anything, more important. For example, they tend to be social emotions. They're the ones that govern or are managing your interactions with other people. And just like Margaret was saying, we know that if you want people to do things, you will always be more successful. If you're if you're 
the way that you're rewarding this is a positive way that there is you know one of the best ways of improving mood is to have something to look forward to so it's actually just a better in terms of psychology way of both motivating people and understanding humans is to think about positive emotions and i'm hoping that that is starting to translate into the, the science of how we approach management so the conclusion is the glass has to be half full and not half empty. What an amazing note to wrap up on. Listen, I want to say on behalf of Master and I, thank you so much for joining us. It's been absolutely amazing. I, I could continue on forever. I'm, I know, Master, you could do the same. And we can see that on the number of questions out there, which is in the hundreds at the moment. So we will continue the dialogue online. But Master, before we wrap up, what are some of your reflections so far? Yeah, my reflection is I wish we could talk to these two forever because it's so nice. Speaking of fear, I think we're talking about two people that aren't afraid. And I think that was just a wonderful reflection of people who are able to actually be refreshing and say something that isn't canned and doesn't look like it's, you know, management 101. Amazing. Well, I assume this is somehow leading us towards the direction of a mule summary. So let's just run the mule summary. Now, one of the things I picked up here was definitely the whole idea about the super chickens and the whole idea about that diversity for sure is giving multiple angles to the same topic, which again is creating somewhat of a challenge. So that diversity is really good. I would also say that conflicts is one of the things Margaret talks a lot about. You need to have conflicts in order to ensure that there is this kind of disruption happening here. Super important. Now, conflicts if you have that diversity, it actually has a sense of trust. Now, it's not coming by itself, but if you have diversity, there's so many angles being listened to that trust is starting to be established, hopefully. Now, that leads to some sort of debate, and the debate is leading to innovation. That's one of the things Margaret talks a lot about, that the debate, the conflicts, and the diversity is generating the innovation point. But if I should now swap the angle to Sophie, and this is starting to be tricky with my summary here, well, then I would claim that laughter, on the other hand, probably could be the glue to create that sense of trust and confidence in each other so you feel comfortable about going out on the limp and actually say things which is not necessarily safe, but it's a damn good idea. That is because we are creating a sense of belonging. Laughter belongs to a tribe. We laugh about it and the other people don't understand it. That's really the base. When I spoke to Sophie, she said to me the other day, no one will find the same joke uh, fun. There will always be people which are not finding it fun. And that sense of belonging, again, is generating trust. And trust is then leading to courage. And courage is then, in the end of the day, leading to an alignment because we then align ourselves based on the trust. And that, again, is flipping together with Margaret's idea about that is creating a sense of ideation, creativity, and, of course, courage. So it all comes together in a beautiful mural summary. Marshall, did I pass this exam? Jesus Christ, that was impressive. That was the best summary I've ever seen. I don't know how the hell you did that. So, yeah. <laughs> Neither do I. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> you didn't have little designs. I mean, good Lord. You're, you're over the top on that one. <laughs> thank, thank you. I'm curious to see what Margaret says because Margaret just told me I don't like models. So she's going to kill me when we go into the green room now. But don't. Uh. Anyway, listen, everyone. What's happening next? Well, the 5th of October will be joined by... Nikolov Merchant and Cody Cannon, two extraordinary people who will be discussing the topic of personal branding. And oh my, these people that know their home turf. Cody served as the director of speech writing for President Obama through his whole period. And he helped build the Obama brand. And Nifla selected by the Thinkers 50 as the number one person most likely to influence the future of management in both theory and practice. And actually by Twitter was voted among the 25 smartest women in the world. I mean, those two individuals certainly have a very strong say on how do we build a personal brand. Master, I can't wait to see what they're going to say. Very fun. So that's it. Thanks, Marcel. Thanks to Margaret. Sophie, I can only say see you next Tuesday. Same time, same place. Bye for now.
We've boiled it down to two things that we think are universal. Humble people and hungry people. How do we find people that will hold each other accountable, as uncomfortable as that might be? Teamwork is not a virtue, it's a choice.